Hi, uh, thanks for joining us. My name is Steve Hayes, it's Michael Darby, and we're both from the Connected Technology Business Unit within Element. Um, today, we're going to talk to you about Top Tea Time Tips, our regular update, number eight, as you can see in the background there. Um, and I think the last time we did one of these was uh, a few months ago, September, uh, and we were starting to plan for the autumn or fall meetings of all the different industry groups which we participate in. Um, predominantly, they're focused either on the US with TCB Council or Europe through the Red CA uh, or, uh, and or EU AMB. Um, so today we're just going to go through uh, those different industry updates. Michael's going to lead us off with TCB Council. Um, we've written some notes, um, but... We'll just wing it, yeah, like we always do. Like we always do. Cheers, Steve. Uh, I, I yeah. feel like a newsreader. We've got a desk. Know, we've got a desk and everything. Yeah. We, uh, we, we, we've got a new office uh, area um, in London here, which is uh, where we are based here today. Um, so this is all very new for us. And uh, yeah, they've afforded uh, some tables now for the yeah, first yeah. time. So it's a big day. Yeah. yeah, I feel like a little kid on Christmas morning. So uh, yeah, cheers, Steve. I want to talk about the TCB Council Workshop. So. The TCB Council workshop happens twice a year, and the most recent one was October 2023, held in Baltimore in the United States. So it's a two or three or four day event, depending on what they got going on. This time, there was a two day RF exposure training, first of all, and then two days of the main FCC and Canada workshop. So the RF exposure workshop uh, training didn't really bring anything new. It was more like uh, bringing everybody up to speed on RF exposure and SAR testing. And this is really all about radio frequency energy absorbed into your body tissue, um, non-ionizing radiation for those of you who care. Um, and so that was a good event. There was like people talking about the history of the assessment types. I was one of the speakers. I talked about assessments in Europe. I uh, talked about uh, what do you do if you put a radio module into an end product. And then at the end of the uh, two days, we had like an expert panel session where we answered questions. Uh, and I was on that talking about philosophy of compliance and going way off topic and getting a bit hippie on everybody. And so then we went into the main workshop. We had a whole day of presentations by the FCC and then approximately half a day by Canada and then some industry updates. So what was talked about? Well, you know what? If you've been tuning into these, you'll notice a common theme. Every six months that we have the TCB workshop, there's a topic that keeps coming up. Now I'm a parent, and if I tell my children off consistently for the same thing over and over again, and then eventually I say, right, that's it, this is happening, and they look at me like, where did that come from? And I go, I've told you plenty of times. And I recognize a little bit of that in the FCC in Canada right now, because every workshop, they remind us that if you've got a hardware solution of a product, you must fully test it. And if you change any little component part, you must fully test it. There isn't anything in the rules that says you can test some and you can assume that the others comply, even if it's under the SDOC authorization. In fact, not only is there nothing in the rules that says you can't do that, but it clearly states the only way you can have multiple models under one set of testing is if they are absolutely identical. So Canada, for example, shared some slides where they had, let's say, a laptop, for example, and the two different laptops had all the components, all the radio technology, all the screen and everything the same, but they had different suppliers of camera in the top of the screen. And therefore they were saying, of course, it needs separate spurious emissions testing because the camera is different. And so anybody in the audience that was going, wow, even, even that level of change is obviously not paying attention to the word identical. Okay, so that was a big topic and actually the FCC and Canada both talked about that. It keeps on going as an important topic. Uh, other things that were talked about with regard to the FCC and Canada, Sometimes people would go to a test lab, manufacturers would go to a test lab and say, I want FCC testing. Uh, and then at some point later they'll say, now I'd also like to go to Canada, can I take my FCC test reports and use those for Canada? 
And for some types of technology, you kind of can do that as long as the test reports meet the Canadian requirements. And the Canadian requirements for test report contents are, are more strict or more full, if you like, than the FCC requirements. So sometimes some extra hoops need to be jumped through. And at the very least, the test report needs to show compliance with the FCC rules. There are plenty of technologies like Wi-Fi, for example, where the test methods are different. And then RF exposure or SAR um, or any kind of RF exposure, even for products that aren't held near the body, the requirements for the USA and Canada are so dramatically different that you simply cannot use a test report for one region to show compliance for the other. Uh, another interesting thing, um, both the FCC and Canada um, highlighted the point that they don't speak in industry terms. You mustn't go to the FCC or Canada and ask questions about, I've got this product, it uses 3GPP band N77, for example. Those are terms that the FCC and Canada don't work in. They work in terms like FCC rule parts or Canadian standards, frequency bands and power. So if you go along with industry terminology like key charger or um, 3GPP band this or Wi-Fi 7 that, they're going to say, no, I don't want this conversation. I want you to express it in FCC rule parts. The next part of that is, again, the FCC and Canada both said everybody has to stop trying to use them as free consultants or, or even chargeable consultants. They're not consultants um, and they're not there to answer people's questions. So they really made the point, if a question has ever been answered, don't go asking them the question. So, for example, going to the FCC or Canada and saying, I've got this product, how do I get it authorised? If the answer, or how do I test it? If the answer exists out there anywhere, then they don't want that question. So there are test standards published, there are FCC KDBs published, there's 20 plus years worth of TCB Council workshop presentations of twice a year, there's years of monthly FCC and TCB phone calls. The information might well be out there. And so they're saying, don't go and ask the FCC in Canada, research it and find it yourself. And as a manufacturer, if you can't find the answer yourself, go to a company like, like Element or a consultant or a test lab or a TCB and pay them to do that research for you. Another thing that the FCC in Canada spent a lot of time doing is going through some common mistakes that they see in test reports and in applications. And they made a real point, of course, that if there's a mistake in the test report, then it's a mistake by the test lab and a mistake by the TCB for not noticing the mistake in the test report. You've got to remember that compliance for the FCC and Canada is based on testing strictly the correct way to the correct standard using the correct method. And usually the methods specify every setup of the test in fine detail. And so any little deviation from that is simply a mistake. They talked about some new technology types, Wi-Fi 7, for example. It seems only yesterday that we were talking about Wi-Fi 6, which uh, was allowing uh, or being used, if you like, in the Wi-Fi 6E upper sort of 6 gigahertz, 7 gigahertz frequency bands. Now we're looking at Wi-Fi 7, which is the next protocol level, has big, broad um, channel bandwidths, and it has cool features like channel puncturing. So, uh, for example, it could have a broad channel and take out little sections of that. Really useful stuff for um, data transfer in the Wi-Fi region, but for me as an RF engineer, when I look at a broad channel with some sort of puncturing, it just looks like two smaller channels suddenly, you know, because I'm in a radio background. So suddenly it looks to me like carrier aggregation, but it isn't, it's one channel with a puncture. There's a couple of things to that. Firstly, some of these Wi-Fi test reports are already hundreds of pages long. And the FCC have pointed out that some of these Wi-Fi 7 test reports are probably gonna be knocking on a thousand pages because there's just so many combinations. And if you want to be an early adopter to technology, you're going to end up paying a little bit because you're going to end up having to test all the possible combinations because there won't be an established worst case that we can work off of. And some of the Wi-Fi 7 features will be simply 
unavailable at this time. You know, when the FCC rules were written, they were written such that if Wi-Fi detects another radio, it has to cease transmission on that channel. And so suddenly Wi-Fi groups, they've invented channel puncturing to avoid interference, but actually it doesn't meet the rules because it needs to move off that channel. So it, channel puncturing isn't a solution for um, the contention-based protocol. So lots of interesting stuff there for anybody involved in Wi-Fi 7. Finally, one of my favorite topics, radio modules. Uh, the FCC's guidance on radio modules has been updated. We've been working very closely with the FCC and Canada on this. Um, they haven't changed the rules, but they've made the requirements a lot clearer to understand. Basically, if you see these changes as a significant change, then probably it means you weren't doing everything quite right the first time. So if you um, installing a radio module, you should be able to read the installation instructions of the module and it should make perfect sense. So this was a real message to module manufacturers to make sure that the installation instructions are very clear. Not just, here's your module, the end product must meet the FCC rules, follow the FCC's KDBs and good luck. That, those are legal disclaimers and those are not good enough. The FCC wants to see really a clear test plan in the installation instructions. In fact, if the module doesn't have a shield and is a limited module approval, it must have a clear test plan and they detailed exactly what tests must be performed in the end product. And if the test plan isn't included in the instructions, the installer has to retest everything. So lots of interesting details there. Again, some people were saying, this is a huge change. Other people were saying, well, I, no, I think this is what the FCC has been hinting at for quite a long time, and they finally just written it all down. Um, okay, so um, yeah, and, and interestingly, the FCC did use the term risk assessment, that the installer of a module should be uh, identifying which tests they need to perform in their risk assessment. Sounds, Sounds like a very European term there, Steve. It I really does, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, sorry if I've taken up a lot of time, but uh, I guess quite a lot's happened um, over in the USA then. Great stuff. Okay, fantastic. So then we'll move on to matters of Europe and Red CA. Yeah, so no sooner were we uh, back from the USA uh, that we went out to, I was going to say sunny Portugal, but it's raining actually, uh, rainy Portugal uh, for the Red CA meetings, the notified body group for so, Europe. Yeah, rainy, and we're absolutely lashing it down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and classic uh, British person going off to Portugal for a few days, didn't even take a coat. No. Uh, yeah, you looked a bit weird though in your Bermuda shorts. Yeah, 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 <laughs> you say that. Uh, the Hawaiian shirt did it. Absolutely. And of course, English people, you can't get through a video without talking about the weather, can we? Um, so yeah, and, but we were both there for that meeting, so yep. that was pretty good. It was, in fact, it was great because I think I missed, I joined online for the last one, um, but um, I'm, I'm sure you found it when you went to TCB Council time before last, where it's the first face-to-face -face with a lot of industry colleagues. And so it was great to catch up with a load of old uh, people. Well, I say old. You know and and I mean. us young people, obviously. <laughs> yeah, <that's> right. <laughs> with the snappers that we are. Um, but it, yeah, no, it was really good. And uh, yeah, really good level of debate, actually, that was going on there. Um, and some really good hot topics. Um, Absolutely, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, interestingly, just before the Red CA, um, the EU Commission back in early October had released a new version of the official Journal of Harmonised Standards for the Red. And then a few weeks later, the UK updated their list of designated standards for UK CA marking. So that had just happened. And so test standards was a, a big topic. This whole, we've mentioned them on other videos, tolerances in the standards, measurement uncertainties, and equivalent test sites. Now, I think historically, well, I mentioned a few moments ago that for the USA, you have to test the exact way. Um, but that said, there's quite a few situations with the FCC where you have a choice of test methods. As long as you follow them correctly, you can choose which one you want. Mm. In Europe, the European Commission is trying to get away from that. and They're trying to say there's one test method and you test this one way. And it's all part of this term legal certainty where they want to make sure every manufacturer is going to test the same way. So in the past, we might have seen standards where it allowed emissions testing in a semi-anechoic chamber or an open area test site. Um, 
or, or a, f a fully anechoic chamber. But they're trying to say, well, that, that's not okay unless it can be demonstrated that the tests are equivalent. So Etsy, for example, are doing a lot of work to demonstrate the equivalence uh, of those different test sites. But for some of them, I think in the EU A and B, there was a standard where the two different test methods were pretty dramatically different. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, maybe we'll just briefly talk about that because it is a big topic, actually. Um, and as you rightly say, in the EU AMB meeting, which is the EMC notified body forum, um, which normally gets held at the same time as the Red CA meetings, um, but ADCO, which, if you like, are the market surveillance authorities um, for each of the directives. The EMC ADCO uh, chairperson was talking about uh, action or campaigns that they've done relating to household products. Now, when it comes to EMC testing of household products, there is a dedicated standard, and it's for household appliances. So going back you know, a couple of decades, most household appliances Really, we were thinking about white goods, um, you know, where maybe thermostatically operated, motor operated, where it was just basically a box with a mains cable coming out of it. And they allowed uh, a, a measurement called disturbance power because the, the mains cable is the primary radiating element. So rather than manufacturers pay for big, expensive shielded rooms, anechoic chambers, all those sorts of things, it was just a low cost way of doing like a proxy for a radiated emissions test by saying the mains cable is the main radiating element, put a clamp around that and whatever's coming off that there's an equivalent to a radiated field. Fine. And it works. And it's, it's still true where the mains cable, where it's a, a relatively benign product. But that standard also applies to some pretty high-tech products now, microprocessor-based. And, and actually, there are multiple cables and multiple, the dimensions are such that the radiation comes off in, in various different ways. And so a number of years ago, they allowed for radiated emission testing to bring it in line with other CIPRA, CISPRA standards. But now, as you were saying, you've got two methods, right? Yeah. And, and so from an ADCO point of view, they're sort of saying, well, it fails the radiated emissions test, but equally, you have this disturbance power test that you can still use. So, so they were looking at saying, well, it fails the standard. Yeah. Does it fail the standard? And even if it does fail the standard, does it actually fail the directive? Because the standard, this whole legal certainty thing, the standard isn't the law. The law is products shouldn't interfere with radio spectrum other equipment. Mm. And so you can still fail a standard and comply with the law, but equally you can pass a standard and fail with the law. It's just a, a convenient vehicle. So this whole issue of alternative um, or equivalent test methods is, is I think, going to be debated quite a bit over the next few months. Yeah, I think so. And the European Commission was saying it's not always just a case of comparing the two test methods. That is important, but it's also saying, if you're gonna pick a test method, is this one accurate? Or if you're gonna pick a test method and this one, is it accurate? And then when you compare them, are they similar enough? So for example, two different radiated test sites, are they similar enough that we're all happy? But in, in this case of either a power clamp or a radio test, the difference was so dramatic that, yeah, the manufacturer could say, I tested it and it passed. And then market surveillance would say, well, we tested it and it failed. We're using different test methods, though, and they're quite radically different. Yeah. And that's probably quite a good segue into sort of an, another bit of the conversation, um, which sort of relates to standards themselves and yeah. which ones to apply. Um, we've got the official journal, yeah. list standards, date of withdrawal from the official journal, but then with all the complications of this legal certainty, which of those should you use? Should you only use standards which are listed in the official journal, or should you use a more or a newer standard if one exists? Yeah. And it's funny because if we look at the history of how these standards are supposed to work, and how the official journal is supposed to work, and how the radio equipment directive is supposed to work, it should look like this. Etsy or Senelec gets a mandate to say, right, please write a standard. They write a standard. They submit it to the European Commission. The Commission says, yeah, it's a good one. We'll put it on the official journal. Manufacturers follow that a harmonized standard. 
if something happens that they, people say, oh, we could do with a little bit of an update to this standard, then there's a new mandate for a new standard. Manufacturer keeps using the harmonized one. Meanwhile, the standards body, Etsy or Senelec, writes the new one, let's call it version two, and they write that, and then it gets published, and it gets submitted to the European Commission, and the European Commission says, yeah, we like that, or no, we don't like that. But let's say they say, yeah, we like that. Then it gets added to the official journal, you have a transition period where you can use either one, and then the original one comes off of the official journal, and you're all using the second one. Nice and neat, nice and simple. Well, the trouble though, happens in the last few years where we've seen two things happen. Firstly, when the Radio Equipment Directive came out, there was a bit of a flurry of getting lots of standards harmonized. So we've got harmonized standards on the official journal, and we've got these new versions of the standards which have been published. And because of the kind of the difficulties of getting standards listed, the new standard is really not always that new. It's still quite old, but it's not harmonized yet. And when we talk about risk assessments, manufacturers are encouraged to always follow the state of the art. So for both of those reasons, the manufacturer would start going, should I be using a harmonized standard, which is actually quite an old standard, or should I be using the new standard, which is the state of the art, it's actually been around for a few years, but it's not a harmonized standard, so it doesn't give me presumption of conformity. If we follow the legal advice, we would say, go to the harmonized standard. But if we follow common sense, we'd say the newer one. Now, luckily, in most cases, the differences are minor. In most cases, you could go to the lab and say, actually, I meet both. So I'm future proofed and I'm legally covered. Um, but if you use a newer version and therefore the state of the art, don't forget, if it's a radio standard, you're gonna to need to go to a notified body. If it's an EMC or safety, you're not. And don't ever get confused by the date of withdrawal in like a Senelec standard, because we're talking here about regulatory approvals and CE marking, where that date of withdrawal doesn't, doesn't really have any relevance. Mm. Uh, but yeah, interesting yeah. stuff. No, it, and it sort of links back to the tolerance of measurement uncertainty bit as well, because I can't remember if it was the last Red CA meeting, but there was a proper aha moment mm. where the commission were explaining their interpretation of measurement uncertainty and tolerances, which was slightly different to the notified bodies, manufacturers, test labs, which were in the room. And so since that last meeting, there's been a sort of meeting of minds, if you like, in, in, in terms of understanding the position uh, of, of each party stakeholder. And things like, you know, where it says, mount the product on a table that is 0.8 of a meter plus or minus a little bit. Well, that wasn't acceptable because it was a tolerance and the commission, because of legal certainty, didn't like tolerances. But now we've sort of got to the point and understood the position, I think the commission's a lot more relaxed about some of these instances where tolerances have been used. I mean, fundamentally, the commission doesn't like tolerances. Measurement uncertainty, quite acceptable because it's a factor of physics. You, know, you take a measurement of anything, there's an associated uncertainty. Tolerance is on the hand, inherently a bad news because it implies a range of results. But we got to that point of understanding each other. And as a result of that, I think we can expect the, a number of the EMC standards for radio, so the EN301489 series of standards to be listed in the official journal in the not too distant future, because all of the restrictions that were previously there are going to be withdrawn because of this issue that we just highlighted. Yeah, so that was yeah. a good positive step forward, actually. I think so. And I think what it all comes down to is they don't want the manufacturer to pick up the standard and go, oh, I've got some decisions to make. What shall I do? Um, they want the manufacturer to go, oh, here's the standard. Here's how I apply it. And there's no choices. So that Because if there were choices, you'll get variation between manufacturers. And choices uh, leads quite neatly onto the next topic, which I'm sure none of you are interested in, cybersecurity. Uh, and I mentioned choices because, of course, some manufacturers would say my product is a high risk security issue and other manufacturers would go, my product is very low risk. But there's not really much room in European standards for a manufacturer to make such decisions. So 
What's happening with cybersecurity? Let's give a little bit of an update. Firstly, in the UK, that's the first thing that's going to be happening. In the UK, we have the PSTI, and I've made the decision not to try and memorize exactly what that acronym means, uh, post-traumatic stress infrastructure or something like that. Uh, product security, telecommunication infrastructure. Act. Act. <laughs> um, it will take, uh, become uh, legally mandatory from the 29th of April, 2024. It applies to sort of home consumer, home or office consumer IoT type equipment. There's a clear scope in the, uh, in the, the, the act itself. Um, it doesn't apply specifically to radio equipment, so it's radio or, you know, wired or wireless, um, just this particular type of products. It's based around the standard EN303645, but not the whole standard, just some selected, only really sort of four or five sort of clauses from it. So it, it's pretty basic concept. Um, oh, sorry to interrupt you, but, hmm. but specifically, it's internet connected devices. Correct, yeah. Either directly or indirectly. Yes, exactly. Um, so yeah, it's, yeah. it's internet connected equipment, hence the wired or wireless thing. Um, and, and it's not linked to the UKCA marking or the CE marking. Uh, but the manufacturer does need to create a, a DOC or a statement of compliance with the UK PSTI. So whether you're putting a product on the market because you've CE marked it or whether you're bringing a CE marked product into Great Britain, regardless, you've got to meet the PSTI as well uh, from 29th of April 2024 if your product is an internet connected home device. Um, and I mean... If you wanted to save some paper, you could put your PSTI DOC on the same piece of paper as your UKCA DOC, um, but they are separate regulations or acts and, and they're not combined. So I think the, the UK PSTI mm. is effectively the equivalent of the EU CRA, the Cyber Resilience Cor Act. Correct. As you say, yeah. it, it's completely separate legislation to traditional C marking, UKCA product marking. Yeah. That's the, the two things. So just to be clear that there are two different types of regulation. Yeah, there. absolutely. And so that would be the first thing on our calendars. And then further out, obviously, we've got the Radio Equipment Directive, Article 3.3 D, E and F. Completely different standards, completely different scope. It connects to radio products connected directly or indirectly to the internet or uh, used as wearable devices, used with children or childcare, or used for transactions, whichever clause you're looking at. There are three new standards being developed for that. I want to say EN18031-1-2 and dash three, um, and they are in progress. This will become a legal requirement from the 1st of August 2025. The standards are due to be finished and available in June 2024, but of course, that's when they'll be finished. You know, you could start going to the standards and getting some guidance even before they're harmonized. You don't have to wait till they're harmonized to use them. If they're not harmonized and you, when the 1st of August 2025 comes, you would need to go to a notified body. Um, but so in general, you could start doing an assessment of your product or testing your product Pretty much now, really, there is an Etsy document that maps the European cyber requirements to their um, cyber test assessment standards. Um, but that won't be a harmonized, the, the Senelec standards 1831, that's going to be the harmonized standard. So you, a manufacturer could start doing a cyber assessment or test or evaluation of their product, but really notified bodies should be waiting uh, until nearer 2025 uh, August to be issuing a certificate because so much could change between now and then. Big difference between testing and authorization, of course. And speaking of notified bodies, um, a few people have expressed concern that when you look on the European Commission's website, there's not that many notified bodies listed for uh, cybersecurity. And that's because the USA-based notified bodies, which is most, <laughs> most of the big ones, um, haven't been listed yet because of the listing process in the USA. Well, the USA designating authority um, has recently made the decision, okay, we think we're ready to move forward now, so you'll soon see 
all those USA-based notified bodies get listed. Mm. Uh, interesting, when it comes to the standards for cyber, that they're effectively, you, you could think of them as generic standards, yeah. the three generic cyber standards. Um, and, and, and the Commission's view is we're only going to mandate the development of those three standards, so we've got something, um, which, which is sort of contrast that against the radio EMC and safety standards, where they're saying, unless we don't like generic standards, <laughs> it needs to be very specific product to the specific. product. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so there's a slight, I, I wouldn't really say contradiction, but yeah. there's a slightly different philosophy for cyber than it is for all of the other things, yeah. which is causing a little bit of confusion. Yeah, you look at all the radio standards, you've got standards for RFID, standards for cellular, standards which doesn't mention Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, but you know that's what it's for. Yeah. And then, yeah, you go to cyber and it's just like, connected to the internet? Use this one. <laughs> um, and, and speaking of connecting to the internet, of course, probably the question I receive the most is, what does indirectly connected to the internet actually mean? And so we have the red guide, where it isn't answered. And the European Commission and market surveillance authorities are working on a new version of the Red Guide. We had hoped that we would have it in 2023. We're now being told it will be early 2024. Um, and I did ask them, are you going to clearly define what indirectly connected to the internet means in the Red Guide? And I know that's a big challenge for them. Uh, and I, I don't think they really appreciated the question because it's a difficult thing to answer, but they know they've got their work cut out with that one. Mm. Um, other exciting updates. So Article 3.4 of the Radio Equipment Directive. You may not have even realised there was an Article 3.4, but there really is. Um, and it's all about this sort of common charger, if you like, common charging port, um, USB-C, things like that. Hopefully you're on top of that. Uh, this will become a requirement for a, a sort of set types of products from December 2024, and then laptops will follow soon after. And it's not just about does the product have a oval shaped connector? Is it following the USB-C shape? It's more than that. It, it's the, does it have the handshaking, the USB-C protocol, um, all the safety requirements, things like that. So uh, that, that's sort of a hot topic at the moment. So Article 3.4 is, is basically an additional article that's just recently been added to the red. And we hope that will be defined more clearly or answer, some questions answered in the red guide. And in fact, not only are they defining the charging port, but they're also now looking at should we harmonize a wireless power transfer solution so that if you buy a new product, your old wireless power transfer uh, charger would also work. Yeah, and let's not forget why this has been introduced. This is all about the um, uh, re reduction. It's almost environmental legislation, actually. You know, historically, where you've got a new cellular phone, for example, and in the box comes a charger and a cable and the phone, um, and then you open it up, take the phone out and you never use the charger and the cable because it's the same as the one before. Well, the common charger initiative is really environmental legislation that says, yeah, let's just standardise the whole thing and then that will reduce the amount of waste that is created um, and improve the environmental aspects of, of these types of products. So yeah. uh, it's got all good intentions. And as you say, um, we're legislating now for a wired charging connection, yeah. but actually, as society, we don't like cables. We like wireless interfaces. Yeah. Um, and, and so the next thing, I think the, the study will be uh, by the end of this year. Um, I, I can't remember if that's launching the study or the completion of the study. But, but anyway, yeah. there's a study that will be on this common uh, wireless power transfer WPT interface, which will then, uh, again, reduce the number of wireless chargers that will uh, flood the market. Yeah, and have to be flood, flood the market. market and then end up on landfill. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. Which is, and, and so almost as if we plan these things, this leads me to our <laughs> next topic, which is also related to the sort of environmental sustainability aspects. So... Yeah, firstly, uh, the Eco Design Directive, which most people associate with things like, you know, washing machines, uh, white goods, things like that, uh, being updated to include phones and tablets. Uh, and I think it's an important step because 
there are so many phones and so many tablets. The internet and a lot of internet apps are such high energy using um, features uh, that, uh, yeah, you know, it's like you can flood a kitchen if there's enough taps dripping in the kitchen kind of concept. Um, and so there's a lot of changes going on there. But also, um, it, it brings in this thing where sometimes you can have two different regulations that kind of cause trouble by conflicting with each other or, or um, uh, presenting whole new uh, problems which were not really anticipated. So let's say, for example, the Blue Guide, which is the, the high-level guide of European compliance, been around forever, it basically says if a manufacturer places something on the market and then somebody modifies that product, then the person who modifies it legally becomes the manufacturer and they take full responsibility for the compliance of it. Now, in the meantime, we then have this right to repair requirements coming in where the manufacturer sells a product and says, right, well, you have to be allowed to change the battery in case the battery goes flat or you have to be allowed to change the screen in case the screen gets cracked. So there's a couple of things there. Firstly, manufacturers are really trying to say, well, I want my phone or my watch to be completely waterproof so that people can go swimming with them. But then at the same time, you just told me that the user must be allowed to change the battery or change the screen. So how is that going to affect the, my plans for a waterproof product? Secondly, if the manufacturer of the product has assessed their product with the screen for perhaps RF exposure or EMC, the battery for product safety, big part of that, and then the user changes the battery or changes the screen and doesn't put an original part in it, then they've modified that product. They might have created an unsafe product by putting a non-authentic battery in it, and then they are legally the manufacturer of that product then. I think it's a topic in great discussion. I mean, the obvious answer is that the manufacturers of the products need to make their own spare batteries and screens as affordable as other parts on the market to encourage the users to repair them with authentic parts. But Wow, I guess that's probably even harder to do yeah. than it was for me to say, and it was pretty tricky for me to say. Yeah, yeah. but I guess from a manufacturer's point of view, they'll argue that the reason why they're more expensive is because they've been tested thoroughly. Absolutely. Um, and and, and you know, there's a reason why certain products are cheaper than others. Absolutely. Yeah. You could always buy a cheaper one on the internet, and, and there's probably a reason why it's cheaper, is because it hasn't been tested. And then finally, um, I guess one last topic, radios into vehicles. Again, it's something we've talked about a lot um, and um, the work is still ongoing. I think the conclusion at this time is that, you know, when radio parts are manufactured for a vehicle, the manufacturer of that radio part does all the CE marking to the radio equipment directive. And then historically, the vehicle manufacturer would put them all together and sell the car. And, and you know, the European Commission on Market Surveillance was making a real point that actually the vehicle manufacturer is the distributor of all of those radio parts. And if those radio parts were never actually originally assessed in the car with those other radios, then effectively the vehicle manufacturer has modified them slightly from their original concept. So the vehicle manufacturer then has effectively modified the radios or their use case and is distributing them. So in both of those cases, the vehicle manufacturer, even though they don't make a radio product, they are in scope of the red themselves and they should be doing a risk assessment and evaluations or tests on that end vehicle as a radio product. And this is one of those, I mean, we've been talking about radios in vehicles, well, I think probably since the first of these top tea time tip updates. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's quite good, I, I, I guess, now, although it's taken a long time, the Commission have actually picked this point up um, and consulted with us, with industry, if you like, um, and, and shared with us a, a working document that they've got that they're going to update the red guide with. Um, and so within Red CA, the working group, we've uh, debated that and provided some comments back to the commission. Uh, it, it, interesting, actually, we sort of think get put in our place, but, but the commission reminded us that you know, from time to time they will go and consult with people 
But they won't go, yeah, we agree or no, we'll disagree. They'll just consult with a number of stakeholders, um, review the inputs that they get. But, but ultimately, it's their law, they're mm. their rules, and they'll either accept or, or reject whatever. But they won't come back to you and tell you. Mm. They're just gathering input from a number yeah. of stakeholders. Consulting with industry doesn't necessarily mean paying any attention. Mm. It just means saying, yeah. oh, thanks for your input. But, but nonetheless, but, it, it's a great step forward and yeah. the Commission's taken it seriously. And um, you, you mentioned about the red guide being updated and, and, and this will be one of the updates that's yeah. included. So that's great news. Yeah. yeah, so there are more updates. I mean, obviously, we've talked about TCB Council, Red CA, EU AMB. Uh, the other thing that happens at this time of year, so in the autumn fall of, of every year, are the plenary meetings of IEC and CISPA. So plenary really just means everybody coming together once a year um, to talk at high level about the big topics within standardization. So the IEC has just met in um, Cairo in Egypt. Um, for the first time in, in a little while, actually, CISPA, which is to do really with the, the EMC side or emission side of, of uh, disturbance measurements, um, didn't go to Cairo. Um, in, in, instead of that, it had a series of online meetings. Um, it was slightly unfortunate that uh, one of those weeks coincided with the, the Red CA, but nonetheless, uh, we, like a number of other people, attended uh, a number of CISPA meetings. I don't think, I mean, th there isn't a lot um, of really big stuff that's going on in terms of imminent publications at the moment. The, the big ticket items, certainly in terms of CISPRA, is the preparation of standards to cover the frequency range 18 to 40 gigahertz. Uh, we've talked about that previously. Why 18 to 40 or actually 43 gigahertz? The answer is CISPR is to do protect radio services, and we have now a number of radio services above 18 gigahertz. Then when it started to, to standardize for it, we realized, well, we don't define test equipment typically or test methods above 18 gigahertz. There's no calibration of chambers, all those sorts of things. So a lot of work being done in the different areas, test equipment, test methods, calibrations, measurement uncertainties, all in that frequency range 18 to 40 or 43 gigahertz. So work is being done there. Don't expect any standards in the next year or so. Um, these things take up much longer than that. That said, at the other end of the spectrum, um, predominantly driven by more switch mode, nonlinear load type technology, is uh, below 30 megahertz radiated tests. And again, um, some standards have required magnetic field measurements, magne magnetic field strength measurements for, for many years. I remember when I first started uh, in, in the early 90s as a, a test engineer, we had VDE standards, German requirements at the time that had requirements, radiating requirements above nine kilohertz. But actually, when you look at the standards, there's no calibration of the loop antenna, how you verify the test site, those sorts of things. So many of the basic EMC standards, so the CISPR 16 series, have recently, a uh, number of them have been updated to define calibration uh, of the test site below 30 megahertz, um, the calibration of the loop antenna, the test method, all those sorts of things. So they're actually now... Um, gradually being implemented and referenced from a number of the product standards themselves. Um, household products, uh, industrial, scientific, medical, uh, multimedia, there are all is work is being done to update all of those standards, um, various different um, levels of progression in terms of publication of standards. Um, I think probably the next one to be published is CISPR 11, on industrial scientific and medical equipment, ISM equipment, uh, and we can expect a new CISPR 11 edition seven uh, coming out early 2024. Um, I think that's probably it from CISPR. I mean, I, I could get into the detail, but to be honest, um, the updates, if anybody has an interest in that, I mean, I think really just get in contact through element, uh, normal uh, means of communication to, 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 to ask specific questions because it's 
probably in the minutiae a little bit. Um, other stuff, what, what else have we got? I mean, Christmas is around the corner. Christmas is coming. <laughs> I had my first ever mince, well, not first ever, but I had my first mince pie of the year there last night. Wow. Cup of tea and a mince pie. It's, uh, not, it's not even December yet. Okay. Well, no, and, and actually, uh, I, I don't even know to mention it because it'll time stamp this, but it's Thanksgiving week. So, so all of our uh, US based uh, colleagues and friends over there, uh, happy holidays and Thanksgiving to, to you guys. Yeah, it's good yeah. for us because we get a chance to catch, catch up on up. some work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, and um, we've got the EMC Test Lab Association meetings coming up. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, that'll be the 5th of December. Um, yeah, exciting stuff, lots of summaries, lots of work um, uh, by various different Yeah, in fact, actually, I mean, that's quite interesting because there's slightly different there that the audience covers both commercial civilian requirements as well as aerospace and military or defence. Um, so, so there's different working groups working on different topics there. So, uh, yeah, if you've got an interest in that, then reach out to myself or Michael and we can uh, help update you on, on some of those activities as yeah. well. And we have the, the UK government attending that meeting to talk about the, the CE marking or the acceptance of CE marking into the Great Britain and things like that. So yeah. that'd be good. OK, yeah. right. Well, I think that's a wrap for today. Thank you ever so much for tuning in and listening to uh, us on this Top Tea Time tip. Um, the next one probably will be uh, in the spring of 2024. Um, so I guess... Happy Christmas. Uh, see you on the other side and uh, look forward to uh, another session in, in 2024. Thank you.